Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce Thought Leadership Series. This week, we are diving into key legislative updates. I am your host, Adelia Carrillo, CMO of Event High, uh, live currently at MJ Unpacked, but we have an amazing show for you today. We have two co-hosts who are going to be joining us and two guest speakers to share their insight and knowledge on key legislative updates. Now, before I bring on our guests, uh, feel free to comment in the chat below below on where you're joining us from today and use that Q&A button if you want to submit some questions and our uh, two hosts will go into those at the end of the segment. Now, uh, let's get to why you all are here today. So first up, I would like to introduce you all to Hirsch John, is the founder of Ananda Strategy, a consultancy serving many of California's leading cannabis brands and retailers, guiding their expansion strategy um, competitive licensing efforts, and M&A transactions. Hirsch serves as chair of the Los Angeles Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, which aims to promote the common interests of cannabis businesses in Los Angeles County by advocating for sound on public policy and facilitating business partnerships between cannabis operators. He's also the vice chair of the California Cannabis Chamber of Commerce. In addition, Hirsch is on the board of, of directors for the California chapter of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, uh, so California Normal, which is for 50 years has been working to reform California cannabis laws, lead the opposition to the war on drugs in California, and co-sponsored California's pioneering medical cannabis law, Prop 215, in 1996. So with that being said, welcome, Hirsch. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah. And next up is Tim Moreland. Tim is the owner of Moreland Consulting, LLC, a premier cannabis compliance firm specializing in financial services, licensing, compliance, competitive applications, and government affairs work. Tim serves as the California market leader from, I hope I'm saying this uh, correctly, so please, Tim, if I, if I butcher this, let me know, Abaca and... Abaca. Yeah, Africa, yeah. Africa and Pacific Valley Bank. Tim also serves on the board uh, for the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, and he serves as a board member for Mendocino Cannabis Alliance Policy. So welcome, Tim. Thank you for joining us as well. Great to be here. Yes. And I'll let you two take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Adelia. Uh, really appreciate that introduction. And everyone, you know, the chamber is really excited to to host this uh, conversation today about legislative updates uh, in cannabis in California. So just to give you a quick rundown of how this is going to work, um, we're going to start by doing some introductions. So uh, Tim and I are going to introduce our uh, guest speakers. And so I'll introduce Senator Weiner, And then uh, Tim is going to introduce uh, Assembly Member Berman. And we're really excited to have them today. So that's the first thing we'll do some quick intros. Um, the second thing we'll do is I'm just going to run through some of the key topics that we're going to cover on today's webinar, just so everyone who's watching has a sense of what the, the key issues are that we'll be running through with our, our two guest speakers. Uh, and then the third thing we'll do is we'll toss it over to our speakers to just give some opening remarks. So after previewing what this conversation will touch on, we'll, we'll give it to them to share any thoughts that they want. And then um, we'll go ahead and, and jump into uh, Q&A after that. So we'll do some intros, cover the key topics, opening remarks, and then Q&A. So I'll start by introducing uh, Senator Weiner, and then I'll toss it over to uh, Tim to introduce uh, Assemblymember Berman. And so we're so excited to have both of these speakers uh, with us here today. Um, so Senator Weiner, as many of the folks uh, know on this call, is you know a leading figure on many issues uh, in California. Um, he's a state senator, and he uh, represents the 11th district. And as you know, folks know that includes all of San Francisco, but also areas south of San Francisco like Colma and Daly City uh, and South San Francisco. And um, you know, Senator Weiner was elected to the Senate in November of 2016, and then he was reelected again in 2020. And, you know, he's been a leader on a, a number of issues, right, outside of cannabis. As some of you may know, you know, he's been a huge champion for making housing more abundant and affordable in California, um, has a big, been a big proponent of our public transportation systems uh, in California, has been a huge advocate for increasing access to health care uh, amongst Californians, um, fighting climate change, and also reforming our, our criminal justice system. And so has been a huge advocate um, on those issues and has advanced um, legislation on a bunch of those causes, um, including on, on, on the housing issue, where he has uh, sort of helped advance SB 35 to help expedite um, housing permits. Um, so that, that's a number of the issues Senator Weiner has, has worked on, but we're really excited to talk to him today about his efforts to expand cannabis access um, 
in California, particularly for, for medical cannabis patients. And so we're going to be talking a lot about his bill, SB 1186, um, that passed this session. Um, I'll also just note before tossing it over to Tim that, you know, Senator Weiner, before he was a state senator, served on the San Francisco uh, Board of Supervisors uh, for a number of years. And he's been a San Francisco resident for, you know, more than a quarter century. Um, he grew up in New Jersey, um, graduated from public schools there. Uh, attended uh, Harvard Law School and has been a resident of San Francisco since 1997. Uh, so really excited to have him here with us here today. And I'll toss it over to Tim to introduce uh, Assembly Member Berman. All right, great, great to have you, Senator Weiner. Um, want to introduce uh, a wonderful Assembly Member, uh, Assembly Member Mark Berman. Uh, he is from the 24th District uh, uh, Assembly District, and that includes Southern San Mateo County and Northern uh, Santa Clara County. Um, Assemblymember Berman was elected in November of 2016. Um, Assemblymember Berman serves a key position uh, as the chair of the Committee uh, on Business and Professions, which oversees a lot of different aspects of our economy, everything from health, uh, from gaming, et cetera. And it also, most importantly, to I guess to us, uh, they represent the cannabis. Uh, they control cannabis regulation in the state of California. So it's a very important committee for cannabis. Almost all of the legislation that is passed that goes through the state assembly and senate has to go through uh, Assembly Member Berman's committee. So he's a key figure uh, for cannabis and also very friendly towards the subject as well. Um, um, Assemblymember Berman has an amazing uh, success rate for his legislation. About 60, uh, he's had 61 bills uh, go to the governor, and that's just in five years of office. Of office. Uh, so he's championed legislation um, regulating uh, election officials. To uh, he's also worked on mail-in uh, voter ballots, which are very popular. I love those. Um, and also working on some key educational and mental health issues for, for youth. Um, prior to his time in the assembly, he was a Palo Alto city council member and uh, worked for a very prestigious law firm um, as well. So thank you so much, assembly member Berman. Pleasure to have you and look forward to talking with you. Thanks, Tim. Great. Thanks, Tim, and thanks again to, to our speakers. As I mentioned, what I'll do next is just run through the topics that we'll wanna cover with our speakers today. There's about five or six different topics that we've identified, and then we'll hand it over to them to give any opening remarks that they'd like to give on, on cannabis um, more generally. Um, so so we'll, we'll hand it over to them in a second. But to give everyone a preview of sort of the core topics you know, we wanna talk about, the first will be access. You know, As we know, cannabis access, you know, access to legal cannabis remains limited in California, and we'll wanna get our speakers' thoughts on expanding access and and I think in particular, um, we'll want to hear from Senator Weiner about um, SB 1186 and his efforts to expand um, medical cannabis access in California. So that's the first topic. Uh, the second topic that we'll go through is taxes. You know, I think we'll want to get our speakers take on the recent tax reform package that passed in California. Um, what more might need to be done and you know, how um, effective they think uh, that was. So that'll be our second topic. Uh, the third thing we'll talk about is the illicit cannabis market in California. This has been getting a lot of media attention in recent weeks and is directly tied to those issues of access and taxation. So we'll talk about the challenges of the illicit market and what can be done to manage it. Uh, fourth, we'll also talk about employment rights. You know, as many folks know, recently a bill passed that will prevent employers from penalizing, um, you know, folks for off-duty cannabis use. And so we'll want to get our speakers take on what that means for the future of cannabis rights in California. And then just you know, a, a couple more issues we'll, we'll tackle. Uh, we'll wanna get our speaker's take on future legislation, interstate commerce, and what other you know, reform efforts might, might happen going forward. And finally, I think we'll wanna get our speaker's feedback on how all of us are doing. You know, many of us on this call are cannabis advocates, and I think we'll wanna hear candidly from our speakers about whether there are things that we could do to be more effective in speaking as one voice in the industry. So. Uh, those are the topics. And, and with that, if it's all right, I'd love to toss it over to Senator Weiner to share any thoughts um, that he might want to share on, on cannabis or, or more broadly. So thank you. Great. Well, uh, thank you for, for having me. It's good to be here with my, my friend, Mr. Berman, um, Mr. Chairman, who uh, are very good at working with us on cannabis legislation and his committee. So thank you. Um, yeah. So um, I think we've had some real progress and I, you know, I, I come from the, um, the, the birthplace of medical cannabis, although my colleagues 
Uh, Senator Skinner uh, from the East Bay would dispute that. Uh, she insists that it was Oakland, but it was really San Francisco. Um, and, um, you know, and, and medical cannabis is just it's very important here, um, particularly, you know, it started out actually before, even before HIV, but really picked up steam during the worst of the HIV crisis, which hit San Francisco so hard. Uh, so many people were dying and suffering and, and cannabis provided relief for people who had no other way of getting relief. Um, and so it just really matters here and really everywhere. And people should be able to get their medicine. Unfortunately, when we, you know, and I supported uh, legalization of adult use of cannabis, um, but that ballot measure, as well as the subsequent implementing legislation by the legislature, really messed with medical cannabis, really screwed it up in a lot of ways. And it did it in two ways. Um, uh, first, it, uh, um, and we dealt with this this year with SB 1186, um, the legislature is not required by the ballot measure, but the legislature gratuitously handed off to cities the ability to ban the sale of medical cannabis. That was just wrong. It was a huge blunder by the legislature. Uh, and we've now, uh, uh, I hope, fixed that uh, this year by making clear that at least that cities cannot ban the delivery of medical cannabis. Um, the ballot measure also imposed very high taxes, and those are they're overly high uh, taxes uh, that have uh, really hampered the legal cannabis industry and fueled the illicit market. Uh, so those taxes, and I say this as a lefty Democrat who typically does not say this, but the taxes on cannabis are too high and need to be lowered, but it really harmed medical cannabis efforts. And this is what we handled a couple of years ago with SB 34, that the compassion programs that for decades have been giving away free medical cannabis to low income patients with HIV, with cancer, or whatever the case may be, people who cannot afford to purchase legal cannabis. Uh, they were still they, under the ballot measure. They were required to pay the 25 percent cultivation and, and, and use and excise taxes, which they didn't have any revenue. So they all started going away. And so with SB 34, which thankfully we were able to pass in 2019 or 2020, I can't remember, um, we exempted those programs from state taxes. Um, and so that uh, that is a is a good thing. Um, but we continue to have um, you know, just overall problems with the supporting the legal industry, overregulation, uh, overtaxation, uh, and then these land use restrictions. That uh, you know, really, I'll be honest with you, and I, I sort of publicly criticized uh, the Rural County Association (RCRC), which had a bill this year to increase. Uh, criminal penalties for illegal cannabis grows, which are very environmentally destructive. So I supported the bill, but they were complaining about that. And I said, you're also at the same time opposing SB 1186 to allow for legal delivery of medical. So you can't have it both ways. You can't insist on banning the legal market and then complaining that there's an illicit market. Uh, so I hope that we can uh, continue to make progress um, on supporting the legal market. The tax reform this year, I supported it, but it, it was not enough. Uh, so again, thank you for having me today. Thank you, Senator Weiner. Um, next, we'll, we'll toss it over to Assembly Member Berman. Well, thank, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks, Hirsch. Thanks, thanks Tim. And uh, thanks to the Cannabis Chamber for, for having us. Uh, always, always fun to share a, a virtual stage with my friend, Senator Weiner. Um, it was good to see you yesterday, Scott. Um, sure. So, no, I, I you know, I, I'll, I'll just say plus one to, to pretty much everything that Scott said. I know we've got some great questions that we're going to be getting to, um, you know, during today's session. It, it's just, um, you know, I, I whilst while Senator Wiener was talking, I kind of was reminded and I was thinking through a lot of the issues that are impacting the cannabis industry. It's, you know, it's like, what do they call a horse designed by committee, like a, a camel? It's you, you have all these voices, all these conflicting voices, um, everybody trying to I, I hate to I'll, I'm a fan of compromise, but but the compromise has led to a regulatory framework that just isn't working. Um, and, and so 
Uh, I think, you know, at, at the crux, that's that's we need to identify what are our goals? What are we trying to accomplish? And then really ask ourselves, you know, does every bill, does every local regulation, does every whatever it is further that goal? Um, or does it conflict with the goal? And and I think we need to start thinking through that, uh, you know, through those glasses a little bit more so that we can fix uh, some of the unintended consequences of, of the proposition of, of prior laws um, and, and really try to strengthen the legal market, crack down on the illicit market um, and, and, you know, that just period. So, um, you know, I know we'll dive a lot more deeper into a lot of the details in, in the questions, but just at a high level, I think we re really need to ask ourselves with everything that we're doing, does it, does it do A or B? Um, and, and if it doesn't do A, you know, then then it's probably not the right idea for California at this time until we get a stronger, more stable legal market. And then we can and and, and until we really weaken the illicit market, um, you know, and then we can start looking at other things. So uh, some high level thoughts. Great. Th thank you both for those opening remarks. So, you know, I think we'll dive into it now. And the first issue we'd love to tackle is access. And I think both of you mentioned this during your, your opening remarks. And perhaps we'll start with SB uh, 1186. And, and look, I think we could talk about this one issue for the entire uh, webinar. And so I'll, I'll just say, you know, a, a couple of things. What, what do you all think the practical impact of the passage of this bill uh, will be? And, you know, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, the bill allows for medical cannabis delivery, but I think many of us know that there are a dwindling number of medical cannabis patients in California. Um, because a lot of those folks don't need to register. You know, they can just buy adult use cannabis. So how do we think that might impact the bill? And, and again, you know, not to ask too many questions, and I'll let you all take this question where you will. Um, perhaps another question is, you know, were you all surprised by the amount of opposition that this bill uh, received? Obviously, there's a tension between what Senator Weiner was saying, you know, compassion and the right to access medicine and this principle of local control, which says, hey, a city can deny you, you know, their rights to keep a business out, um, supersede your rights to access medicine. So how do we see that that tension evolving in, in the coming years? Um, so I'll, I'll hand it to Senator Weiner and, and yeah. you can take the question. Well, the, the, the number of of medical patients, of course, has not gone down. It's the same as before. People still have medical conditions, and of course. And I know, I know that's not what you were suggesting, but and you know, and it's always been really hard for people to get medical cannabis cards, which is why we tended to in these bills refer to recommendations, so that if you have like a a letter from a doctor, basically that that's enough. You don't have to um, ha ha have an actual card. I, I wish we made it easier to get the card. Um, but right, there are people who are patients who are now just, they're getting adult use because, you know, they, they, because they can. Um, I think that, um, you know, with 1186 going into effect, there are you know, people who, who are going to start get, probably be more likely to get a note from their doctor um, so that they can, they can access delivery in places that otherwise that ban adult use. So I think we're going to see that um, and then, um, of course, um, for people who rely on compassion programs, that's still very medical uh, focused. But, but you're right. If we if we had an adult use system that was actually global, where you could get by adult use anywhere, um, and, and we didn't ban it in most of the state, um, you, you, that the two would start blending together uh, more. Other than in the compassion. Uh, uh, programs. Uh, so, but it just does point to the fact that we just need to continue to expand access and stop making it hard or illegal for people to procure cannabis. I and mean, the fact that in 62% of the cities, and you know, you literally, if you want to get cannabis, you most likely have to get it from the illicit markets. Sir. I, I defer to the author of the bill. I, I, I agree with everything Scott said. Great. Tim, any, any questions on, on, on your end? Any follow-ups? Uh, no, that's a, a great summation of the bill, um, the intended legislation, you know, very happy uh, that we got that passed. Um, but um, yeah, we uh, definitely have a fight ahead of us and access uh, is a big issue and it's uh, going to be a big issue for a while. So, um, you know, I, uh, that's what we do here at the Cannabis Chamber as well. We do a lot of local, uh, we have a lot of members who are pushing for local access. So we're, that really strikes a chord here. So thank you very much. And, and, and I'm sorry, did you also, did your question also ask about whether we're surprised about the opposition? 
Uh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, at least I noticed, you know, a number of very strongly worded letters. And I'm, I'm curious whether you, you had read those. Yeah, I mean, the local government groups, the League of Cities, uh, um, the Association of Counties, the rural counties, uh, they all very strongly opposed it. And they sent this absurd uh, joint letter that was, was so misleading. Um, it was it was a classic study of, of I don't want to say lying because I don't like to you know, these are groups I work with, so I'm not going to keep them lying, but, but um, uh, not being straightforward with statistics, let's put it that way. And, and so we had to um, put together a whole fact sheet just sort of debunking the, the very misleading statistics that they were including. And uh, they were trying to portray, like, oh, there's no issue. It's legally available in the vast majority of the state. And it was just not true and listen i get it there these are local government groups that they, they fight for local control and they don't like when the state overrides uh local control and and they should just say that and and not try to pretend that there was greater access um than there was um la county came out very late um with opposition we think that they were misinterpreting uh the um the bill and we met with them and worked with them we just the the concerns they had with the bill, we don't think are real concerns because this bill for cities that already had an existing delivery program, the bill basically has no impact. So LA city and county have been very good at setting up programs there. These are not among the, the cities and counties that are causing problems. And so our view is that LA city and county aren't really going to be impacted probably not impacted at all um, by, by the, by the bill. Great. Thank you for that, Senator. And, you know, maybe one more question on this topic before we move on. Do you see this bill potentially as the first step in a longer term effort? I think this bill reminds some folks of a bill Phil Ting introduced a few years ago that would have required physical storefronts in some of these communities. Is that something that's on your long term horizon or is that not you know. I mean, I, I think we have to grapple with the lack of the, the, the bans. And, you know, with the, it's really interesting. I actually thought when we introduced the bill, we did it in a way that you could choose either one or the other. And there was just a, a bunch of pushback on all sides. No one wanted that that way. So we just made it delivery. And that actually reduced a lot of the opposition, believe it or not. And I, I thought delivery was going to be more controversial in the storefront, but it's not. Because um, I sometimes people think of delivery as like, you know, it's your guy showing up in a neighborhood at 2 a.m., you know, dropping stuff off. And, but people were let very unconcerned about delivery with storefront, which I find to be really weird because people have these stereotypes of like dispensaries being these like shady places. The, the dispensaries that actually, not just in San Francisco, but elsewhere are, they're really nice. They're, they tend to be high end. It's all too expensive. Like the adult use cannabis is very expensive. And it tends to be like really a great addition for neighborhoods. It brings foot traffic in. They're really well run. They have good security. Um, and it benefits all the other small businesses. But there is still this perception that, that it's all shady. Well, I, mean, I don't know, Mark, Mark, you know, especially you, you represent a, a more suburban area. I'm sure you've seen that. Well, I, I mean, I totally agree that I think it's it's uh, stereotypes, it's fear, it's it's not based it, from a lot of people who've never been right to a storefront. They've never been to a retailer. And so they don't realize, uh, you know, Scott's point that these are these are normal businesses, uh, period. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, maybe pop, just popped into my head. And I know this might be a question for later, but maybe getting more local elected officials to vi to visit storefronts, um, you know, could be a good idea to, to try to pierce some of that, uh, some of the stereotypes that they have around it. But, you know, a, a study was done that shows that, um, you know, Oregon has one legal cannabis retailer for every just over 6,000 uh, residents. Colorado has one for just under every 14,000 residents. Um, California, has one legal cannabis retailer for every 29,000 residents. So, you know, as long as that's the case, as long as, um, you know, it's four to one in, in, in Oregon to, to California, we're not going to be getting the strong legal market that we need. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think definitely coming up with a strategy to try to address a lot of the concerns that unfounded, but real 
concerns that that you know local elected officials have then that might be the easiest place to target and then that can hopefully filter down to you know the local communities is probably a good idea that that folks should be thinking about i think that's a great idea and that's honestly how i've worked with local governments in my career in the cannabis industry um you know working on uh, uh applications and such so i recommend everybody on this call uh get your local government representatives even if there's like a city next to yours and you know they're thinking about cannabis, try to get a hold of those local go- those council members, the mayor, and invite them over to take a tour in your store. Um, I did something like that with the city of West Sacramento, who's considering cannabis retail. I was like, well, so I got, you know, I had a connection to the mayor. So I invited her to one of my client's stores here in Sacramento. I was like, hey, here's a tour, you know, here's a here's what a legal dispensary is. And as you said, uh, Assembly Member Berman, they're usually on the upper end. They're ni- and Senator Wiener said that as well. But these are nicer stores. They have to spend a lot of money to draw foot traffic in and then to stay compliant with local and state regulations as well. Uh, it's definitely not cheap. So uh, there's a lot of incentive to take care of that building, make it secure, safe uh, and, you know, keep miners out, et cetera. So. And, and it's a great point, Tim. And then in addition to the elected officials who who you definitely want to try to target, also try to target the city manager. If the city has a business development officer, you know, some of the staff can also be helpful, um, you know, because those are the folks that you're going to be working with the most if they do uh, and when they do allow for, for legal cannabis retailers. Absolutely. Great. Tim, do you want to tee up our next question on uh, taxes? I would love to. Um... All right, this is for both of you. Um, so taxes, um, obviously, uh, and during the budget bill this year, uh, there was a series of tax reforms, um, most specifically removing the cannabis cultivation tax, uh, eliminating that, and then moving tax collection away from cannabis distributors uh, to retailers. Uh, now, um, Senator Weiner, um, know you've been critical of that um, of that piece of legislation. Uh, didn't think it went too far enough. And also others, um, other of your uh, fellow senators and Bradford to be exact. Um, what um, love to get your uh, take on why do you think that was su- uh, insufficient? And then similarly, Verma, if you have an opinion on it as well, love for you to chime in as well. And um, love to hear from both of you, you know, kind of what the tax, uh, what you're thinking and, you know, what the tax rate should look like and um, what's the best way for us uh, as a can- as a cannabis community to engage with uh, the legislature and staff to actually get some real tax reform done. Yeah. Um, so, and I did support the ultimate uh, deal that was included in the budget to Kind of cultivation tax holiday and some limited tax credit for retailers for the excise tax. Um, and just to be clear, you know, the two state taxes combined are 25%, and that's in addition to any local tax that may uh, be levied. So it can be quite high. Um, and so I had er- earlier in the year working with United Food and Commercial Workers, uh, UFCW, which has unionized some of the cannabis industry. Uh, we introduced a bill to um, create, create tax credits for retailers that sort of high road retailers that, that pay decent wages that are, you know, not that are the sort of the, the really good actor that invest in training, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, and then, Senator McGuire introduced a bill to create a tax holiday for cultivation tax. I support his bill and our bill. They're both important. With the, what ended up happening was it seemed like for, some, for whatever reason, the cultivation tax holiday got more traction. And so I think initially the proposal was simply to do a cultivation tax holiday, which I mean, I support the cultivators need relief, um, but that didn't really do a lot for the retailers and cities like mine. Uh, and so uh, myself and Senator Bradford and others made clear to the administration that there needed to be some relief for retailers. So ultimately, they incorporated some credits um, for retailers. It wasn't enough. Um, it was better than nothing, and I was supportive of it, but it, it absolutely was not um, enough. Uh, and so we did this. It'll be helpful, but it's still a problem for the retailers um, having these high taxes 
Uh, and I, I think there's more work to be done. Yeah, I, I agree with Senator Wiener. And, and I think um, and, and the unfortunate part is that now that we just did this, you know, in all likelihood, there won't be appetite from the administration to do much more in the coming years until we get a sense of, of how you know this year's reforms impact uh, the, the market. So what I would say is just to the extent that y'all can you know, keep good data and keep us informed on, on how this is or is not working um, or at least is not working enough um to to you know accomplish that goal um of, of again having a strong legal market in california um keep us informed of that so that we have uh you know good data uh to go back realistically i imagine probably not next year um but but you know hopefully in the not too distant future to say okay that was a a, a decent start um but it hasn't helped it hasn't really accomplished the goals that we're trying to and and so you know we need to we need to look you know, look deeper and do more. Um, so to the extent that, that the industry can keep us informed with, with that good information that helps us, um, go back and say, okay, you know, we tried your, we tried that, but that didn't really work. Yeah. I mean, we could definitely do that. Um, you know, especially from the chamber's point of view, we, we would love to provide, you know, both of you with any information, uh, that we possibly can, uh, kind of just curious from on my uh, a policy front from the tax reform legislation that was passed, um, it does an interesting thing. So it moves tax collection to retail, which I am very in favor of and have been for a while. The problem is, is that, and this is kind of a wonky argument, but I think it's going to have real life uh, repercussions in the legal market, is that right now until January, uh, January 1, 2023, the uh, state markup at the distribution level is set to 60% right now. So that's the, that's basically you take the wholesale costs and you mark it up 60% and then you add the tax on that. So they're trying to catch the full retail market value. There's actually a calculation done by CDTFA uh, every six months. So now that calculation has gone and you're going to have cannabis products. They're going to be sold from a wholesaler or distributor. They're going to be sold to a retailer. And then that final selling price is what the excise tax is going to be based on 15%. It didn't go up. Now, can a lot of cannabis retailers mark up their products a hundred to 200% even sometimes. And that's really common in the industry. And I hope this got communicated, <laughs> but essentially that means you're going to be paying more uh, tax um, because of the markup at the retail level, the higher markup instead of the lower markup, mm -hmm. that, uh, the state markup. And sorry, I know this is it's kind of, you know, kind of a complicated tax issue, but I, I'm really concerned about that. And, you know, hopefully it pans out well, but uh, really concerned that that's going to create access issues to legal cannabis because the prices are going to go up. That's a good that's a very good point. And, and you know, one more follow up on, on the tax issue. I'm curious to, to get your take on this. You know, there's, there's the perception in the cannabis industry that one of the challenges to tax reform um, is that many of the constituencies who receive tax revenue, right, are, are, are close allies with a number of the legislators. And I think that's a reality we have to understand and, and respect. And so I'm curious whether you all think we can tie these issues more effectively together. You know, the access issue and the tax issue. If there's a way the industry can make the case that by expanding legal access in many of these cities, more tax revenue can be generated and, and can benefit these, these constituents. And, and so I guess the question is, is there a way we can make those groups our natural allies, even if they're not our allies on reducing the tax rate, if they can become to some extent our allies on increasing the number of cities that have legal sales so they are beneficiaries of it? Um, of that. I think it's a worthwhile effort. I mean, it's a diverse array of groups and they probably have differing views on cannabis in general, but one of the major stakeholders was SEIU. Um, they were one of, one of the, you know, they had concerns about uh, reduction in tax revenue because it helped fund um, certain, you know, uh, low needs where, where SEIU members were involved. Um, and so uh, I, I think engaging, you know, the CIU, in addition, the UFCW, which is already a natural ally, um, I think can be helpful. Yep, to totally agree. Um, so we'll move on to our next topic. And, and you know, just a reminder that Assembly, Bur um, Assembly Member Berman has to leave at, at 145. So we'll try and give you um, some of the airtime over there. Yeah, I probably do as, uh, oh. as, as far a little bit after that. Fair enough. Great. Um, 
Cool. You know, the next question to, to switch gears a little bit, we'd love to talk about the employment rights bill that just passed um, in, in the legislature, which is 2188. So this is something that doesn't just affect the industry, but I think affects all Californians. And, you know, for those on the line, this would prevent employers from penalizing um, folks for off duty cannabis use. So I think that many of us understand this is, you know, a patient's rights and consumer's rights issue. But was curious if you all had any thoughts on how this impacts the broader California economy and, and the acceptance of cannabis within our, 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 our society. So we'll, we'll let you take that question as you'd like. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's a great bill and I think it's an important bill. I think it's a little early to, to, to be able to tell, you know, what the impact's going to be. Uh, it, it has an implementation date of, of uh, it won't take effect until 2024. Um, so, you know, it, it's just a little bit too early to know exactly how many people will be positively impacted by it and, and kind of, you know, how that impact trickles to the market. Um, I do want to notice that there are a number of exemptions to the bill. Um, and, and so that, that too, will, will kind of restrict whether it's construction trades or people who have a federal background investigation or security clearance that's required as a part of their job or, yeah, you know, other people who have to drive for work. So, it, um, you know, it, it doesn't yet apply to everybody, but it's, it, it does apply to a lot of people and will hopefully alleviate just kind of concerns that they have about their ability to use a legal product um, and not be penalized for it at work and, and not be, you know, and not possibly lose their job because of it. I, when I have a glass of scotch at night, I don't worry about, you know, getting fired from my job the next day. So, it, it, you know, it should be the same thing for cannabis products. Um, so we'll, we'll see, um, you know, with the new employee protections, if more Californians feel comfortable using uh, legal cannabis, you know, lawful, just for comfortable using cannabis, uh, who, who don't currently, or maybe people who do currently, but restrict their use because of their job, um, who, you know, might be less worried about that. So that, you know, those would be really positive impacts, uh, for those individuals and, and also for the market. Um, so, uh, I think it's a good bill. I think it, you know, we'll get a better sense in a couple of years of exactly the impact it has, but I definitely think hopefully it alleviates the concerns that folks have about doing something that's legal in California. Yeah, I think it's super embarrassing that in 2022, you can still get fired from your job because you, you consumed cannabis even weeks ago. And you're not yeah. in any way intoxicated. You simply have, you know, um, uh, test positive because it, it just lingers for a long time. And I, I can't even begin the kind of number of times I've had friends who have been concerns that they were going to having a job interview and they might get tested and you know they you know used cannabis two weeks ago it's just it's ridiculous and, and honestly the, the, I, I was i floor managed that bill uh, on the senate floor and and i thought the opposition was the opposition should be embarrassed um i, I mean i get the chamber of commerce just knee jerk opposes those are, but but it's just embarrassing i mean i get we don't we don't no no employer should have to tolerate an employee coming to work intoxicated or impaired they absolutely should have the right to deal with that um but that that's not what this was about and this bill has been floating around for a long time and i'm, I'm glad that we finally uh got it passed and signed into law and if for, for the record anytime i'm on the other side of a bill that senator wiener supports i'm embarrassed so it's, that's, that's extremely it's, rare mark it's You're a universal rare. rule it is it, i don't know very very no i'm kidding uh but but I, I agree with scott yeah and as a quick follow-up are there future legislative efforts that you think fall into this bucket that that you're anticipating and by this bucket i mean something that doesn't directly affect the industry but is about cannabis rights more generally so one example we'll share with you is that in some states you know health insurance companies are being required to cover you know uh the claims of medical cannabis patients that's just one example do you see this as the beginning of a larger effort to normalize cannabis within our economy and medical system and society I, again you know sort of a a, a new question, but curious if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I, I mean, the big move would be if the if the feds, you know, you know um, what do you call it, uh, change the um, or rescheduled uh, cannabis. Um, I started with the FDA started approving some, some, some treatments. It, it just because we're in this weird space where the state is doing all these things, but the federal level it's still scheduled and doctors can still lose their license for, uh, you know, for prescribing it potentially. And um, so we really need that. Uh, we need that to happen. Agreed. And I, I think we're open to other, you know, other, other kind of ideas in that, you know, that are similar to, to, 
to shoot. I forgot the bill number now. Um, to uh, twenty one eighty eight. Um, I haven't heard of any ideas, but but it, we're also still waiting for the uh, the governor hasn't finished signing or vetoing this year's bills, so we haven't started diving too deep into next year's. Um, but you know, it definitely could be that some folks find ways to um, you know address similar issues. And we'll uh, take any help if you guys know anybody in the Biden administration who wants to do <laughs> like a last minute Hail Mary to help some Democrats out in some downstream elections. Uh, <laughs> it's my heart as a Democrat to see like Joe Biden firing interns because they admitted to using cannabis like two years ago. Um, so if we can convince them, I, I really do think that would be like a great, uh, it would help uh, the Democrats uh, in some elections just to like, throw that into the mix but um <laughs> thank you here on my phone, I, I don't guess. I still don't understand why it's so the politics I mean uh, in Congress you know 90 percent support of gun safety laws don't get passed but but the like cannabis is not that controversial and, and, and <laughs> the Republicans who support it I mean, this state, state, state. State. yeah yeah. Well, yeah it's just but I mean Joe Biden you know I support him but he's, he's also there's a generational issue as well, Absolutely. it was sort of the same with you know Jerry Brown. He was he was not like against cannabis or anything, but there was never like like a more embrace. Yeah, yeah. I think Jerry Brown was just like, hey, uh, this is going to be legal, so we might as well regulate it and get it under yeah. control. That's what I got. This more more pragmatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hurst, you want me to take the next one real quick? I yeah, definitely want to be cognizant of your time, so I'll definitely this will be the last question. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Obviously, there's a market in California, and it's huge. Uh, but unfortunately, most of it, uh, about 75% of it, 70% of it's the illicit market. Yeah. Uh, and uh, all of us licensees uh, and you know businesses surrounding the cannabis industry are, are have to deal with those repercussions and have to deal with that competition. Um, do any of you see any movements and 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 help from the state? collaboration with the state, uh, with local governments, et cetera, to kind of, to, to rein in this problem. And what do you guys see that may be some solutions that we should maybe think about as well in the future? Yeah. I, I mean, it's a massive problem. And I apologize. I, I will have to jump off in a, about three or four minutes. I've got a 3 PM flight and I'm, I'm 20 minutes away from the airport. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's a huge, I mean, it's a huge problem. I, I tried to block off some time on my calendar this morning to start reading the LA times expose like it was like legal cannabis broken promises or something to that effect and the article was so long i couldn't finish it um and you know you're talking about the the impact it's having on communities terrorizing neighbors worker rights you know worker deaths uh the environmental degradation is having not to mention the impact it's having on the legal cannabis market that that we need to strengthen as much as possible um or else or else everything falls apart that we've been trying to accomplish. So, I mean, I, I think it's a really big issue that clearly seems to have gotten a lot worse over the past six years, not, not better, um, which was, which is the exact opposite of what we thought was going to be the impact um, of, of, you know, the proposition in 2016. And, and so uh, I, I think we've already talked about some of the barriers that exist, the local opposition, um, you know, which is a barrier to access, which is a barrier to, to, you know, strengthening the legal market. Uh, you really rigid bureaucracy that we have federal prohibition that creates complications. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work uh, that we, we, we have a lot of work to do, um, you know, within the limitations of prop 64. Uh, and I, so I, I definitely think this is an area that needs more conversation uh, as we start to kind of pivot towards next year, next session. This is something that we should talk about more. We've complicated things. I mean, Scott alluded to this earlier in a different context, but right. We say that if you don't, you know, if you don't allow retailers, then you can't get certain state support. Um, and, and so, you know, in terms of law enforcement um, and, and so that has created an unintended consequence where, you know, the illegal market's just booming in so many counties across the state that have um, that have have uh, not allowed legal retailers in their in their communities. So the, I, I think, you know, I, I, I need to finish reading the L.A. Term, Times, all the articles that they that they wrote. Um, I think we need to have more conversations, um, you know, with the administration and figure out. Uh, what more we can do. I mean, I, I think uh, I'm all for like getting rid of the illegal grows and all that. But we have to also be clear that if you look at the history of the drug war, that, you know, sort of interdiction, supply side, supply suppression efforts 
you know, usually don't work particularly well um, because as long as there's an illicit market, they're going to find a way to provide the supply. And the most important thing we can do, the most impactful thing we can do is to have a fully formed, robust, easily available, affordable legal market. Um, that's what's going to squash the illicit market. Um, but unfortunately, because we allow cities and 62% of them have done it, we allow them to just ban it. Um, we tax it at a way high rate with the regulations are, are too hard for small businesses often to comply with. We, you know, we make it so that the, the businesses that are able to, to make go of it are, are really expensive. We go into a cannabis dispensary in San Francisco. It's not cheap. And so when people can get cheaper, you know, product elsewhere, or there is no legal product available, they're going to do that. So we need to stop pretending that we can have effectively prohibition and, and, and somehow just stamp out the illegal market with law enforcement. That doesn't work. It never has. hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. Um, yeah. Uh, definitely listen market. Um, I, I, you know, I don't want to speak for everybody on the, in the chamber of commerce, but I think we share those views that we do, obviously we want to get rid of this illicit market, but we need to remove the barriers and allow more legal market. Legal market uh, gets rid of the most of the- but that, but that also means that people who are already in the legal business need to stop being protectionist and fight every effort to make it easier for other businesses to enter the market, which, you know, you're, the industry, you know, God bless the cannabis industry, but you guys are so fragmented and all over yep. the map and everyone's fighting with each other and it becomes very territorial and protectionist and like the protectionism needs to stop because that that's impeding the legal market as well. And, and, it, and it makes our jobs, it makes our jobs so much more difficult. Uh, I mean, it, well, yeah. I mean, you know, when, when you've got, when you've got different factions that are, that are, it, it just makes it harder for progress to happen. It makes it harder for the change that's needed to happen when there's so much internal fighting within the industry. Um, and, and it gives people that might, it gives colleagues that, that, you know, might be skittish about the cannabis industry in the first place. It gives them a hook. It gives them a reason to oppose a bill that that might be really necessary because they can say, "Oh, look, there. You know, it's it's not supported by everybody. There are these other folks uh, that are telling me that this is going to be the end of their business as they know it." So um, Scott's point is a good one. I apologize, y'all. I got to jump. Um, but, thank you so much for your time. We really you, yeah. appreciate it. Safe thanks, travels. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it, Scott. Uh -huh. Always fun. See you later. Great. Great. Well, Senator, we want to be cognizant of your time as Thank well. You. So if you got to go, uh, we really appreciate yeah. it. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me. Thank no you problem. so much. Okay, bye. Take, Take care. care. All right. Well, uh, thank you both, Hirsch and Tim, for a great conversation. Um, we did have a couple questions. Maybe we could submit those to you guys and maybe we can get some answers from the senator and assemblyman later. Sure. Can I say something real quick before we jump in? Um, what they just said at the end was very telling. And I know this is going on. There's so much fighting within the trade groups. And this is one of the benefits of the Chamber of Commerce is we're not hyper political like that. Yes, we can have policy events like this. But this is one of this is the major reason why cannabis legislation has a tough time in Sacramento is because of exactly what they just said. So that was a very strong point to the industry. I hope some other trade groups know that message as well. So. Great message. Great message. Yes. And uh, just to add a few final notes. So uh, thank you all for tuning in to this week's thought leadership series on key legislative updates. Uh, also, mark your calendars for those in Colorado. Our next in-person event is going to be on October 27th, the 2022 Colorado Expo and Mixer at Meow Wolf. You can learn more on the Cannabis uh, chamber.com website. Well, thank you all again, and we will see you at the next uh, leg the next thought leadership series. Have a great thank one. You. Thanks, Tim. Bye. See you guys. Well, good job, Thanks. Bye. Bye.